In this section of the course, we're going to be talking about heat. We're going to ask questions like, what is heat? What effects does heat have? What does it take to heat something up or cool it down? What is the difference between heat and temperature? And particularly, how heat moves from one place to another. This is enormously practically useful. On small scales, for example, this is what limits the speed of the processor on your smartphone. The ability to get heat out of it so it doesn't turn into a puddle of molten silicon. On large scales, on a cold day like today, uh, this is what determines why you wear coats to keep the heat in. How thick a coat do you need to survive in given conditions? That's the sort of thing we're going to work out. On bigger scales, heat flow determines global warming and the temperature of planets, and even the entire universe just after the Big Bang. So it's very important. Now the first point to make clear is that heat is a form of energy. Is it different from other forms of energy, like kinetic and potential energy? Well, yes and no. I mean, consider a ball. I can give energy to this ball in two ways. One way would be to throw it. In that case, as it goes arcing through the air, it gains kinetic energy and potential energy. Or I can enclose it in my hands and heat it up from my body warmth. Which is bigger? Well, it turns out the amount of energy it gets from being warmed up by my hands is much bigger than the energy even a fast bowler would give it. But actually, it is just the same kinetic and potential energy as throwing it in the air. Now let's think about a ball at the microscopic level. If I throw it through the air, then after it leaves my hand, then all the atoms are moving in the same direction. So they're all going this way in this case. As they all have the same velocity, in the same direction, the total energy you can just work out as half mv squared, adding them all up. But, let's say instead we heat this up in my hand. Now, the heat coming in from my hand still makes the atoms go faster, but it doesn't make them all go faster in the same direction. Some are going down, some are going this way, some are going that way, all over the place. So this is the difference between heat and normal kinetic energy. They're both kinetic energy. In both cases, atoms are moving faster. In both cases, in principle, you can work out the energy by taking all the atoms and adding up the half mv squared. But if all the atoms are moving in the same way, we can just treat it as a single lump flying through the air. With a situation like this, where they are all going in different directions, is much more complicated. In principle, we could calculate the motion of every atom in the cricket ball as it bounced off other atoms. Unfortunately, a cricket ball has about 10 to the 23 atoms in it, and so that would need a very powerful supercomputer to follow every single one of them. In fact, the world's fastest and most powerful supercomputers at the moment can follow about 10 to the 8 particles, which means there's still 15 orders of magnitude off being able to follow the atoms in one cricket ball. So basically, there's no way with current computing technology that we can track the motion of every atom. Maybe we can do it in a very small molecule, and uh, theoretical chemists do that. But if anything bigger than quite a small molecule, there is no way we can individually track every atom. So we are just forced to do it in a statistical average and call it heat. There is actually an intermediate situation midway between motion and heat. This is called turbulence. If, for example, I make the water move, to begin with, the water is moving as a bulk motion, like the ball thrown through the air, all the same direction. This is called a Kolmogorov cascade. To begin with, everything's moving in the same direction, all the atoms moving together. But then, the motion breaks up, you get little eddies and whirls. This is turbulence, and this is, looks something like this at the atomic level. So it looks a bit random, some are going up, some are going down, but it's not totally random. You see the atoms close to each other still tend to be moving in the same direction. So the ones on this side are going down, the ones on this side are going up. But these turbulent whirls get smaller and smaller and smaller, until eventually you end up with pure heat. The motions are totally random and there are no more patterns to it. And this is what happens whenever you uh, breathe air out or stir up water or swim. To begin with, you're giving a bulk motion, everything in the same direction. It breaks up into smaller and smaller whirls and eventually ends up as heat. In a monatomic gas like, say, hydrogen, then the heat really is just kinetic energy. Each atom moves around, bounces off other atoms, moves in random directions, and that's what the heat energy is. In a diatomic gas, like the oxygen and nitrogen that I'm mostly breathing in at the moment, it's a bit more complicated. 
Each molecule is moving around and has kinetic energy, but in addition, each molecule consists of two atoms held by a chemical bond. And they can vibrate the bond, or they can spin in different directions. And it turns out that half or more of the energy is actually in the form of the spinning and the vibration, and not in the form of motion, but the motion is still significant. In solids, it's more complicated still. Once again, you get the kinetic energy of the atoms moving around, and you get the spring energy of the bonds between them. And they all move in complicated oscillatory ways. Typically about half the energy is in the kinetic energy and half is in the bond energy of the springs at any given time.